Welcome back to ECE 501B. We are closing in on the last part of the semester and because of that I wanted to make sure that we were all aware of what's remaining on your docket for this class and I've broken down the project. Mainly the main part of the project is deliverable number two but in semesters past I've had students forget about the first and third deliverable so I'm trying to be very explicit about those. The deliverable number one which is really give me your plan for what you're wanting to do and hopefully you're beyond that but if not it's due Sunday the 15th of November. Homework seven is now posted and that's due the following Monday on the 23rd and then a couple Mondays after that is homework number eight. That's getting us into the last week of the semester and what I didn't post here is the final exam and I think the final exam in this class is not on a Monday or a Wednesday. I believe it's on a Tuesday. So double check that and make sure that you're available to attend the final exam which is not on a normal meeting date. It's on a Tuesday I believe the Tuesday during the full week or the last week of finals. What I want to do today is get further into chapter seven. As a review, here is what we've already talked about, which is proposition seven six, that if T is normal, or what do we mean by T, an operator being normal, and that's that these norms are the same that the norm of TV is equal to the norm of T dagger V. We also showed, I think, at the last, right before we stopped having class time before the exam, we showed that this particular operator made up of this combination of the operator and its adjoint, that is self-adjoint, meaning you could take the adjoint of that operator and show that it equals that particular operator itself. Today what I want to do then is start with properties of normal operators. We'll examine the eigenvalues and eigenvectors or what the relationship is between the operator T and its adjoint relative to eigenvalues and eigenvectors. That's corollary 7-7. Seven, seven. Then if you do have distinct eigenvalues associated with that operator, that then implies that you have orthogonal eigenvectors for those distinct eigenvalues. That's the next corollary, which is eight in chapter seven. Then we really get into one of the key results of going through the first seven chapters are these spectral theorems, and we separate those into two one in, with complex inner product spaces and one with real inner product spaces. And all of that sort of relates to the fact that in real inner product spaces, you may not have eigenvalues. And remember that you may end up with this two by two block that doesn't have real eigenvalues associated with it. I've listed the spectral theorems together, but actually squeezed in there, we will cover some background information to give us a little bit more detail before we state the spectral theorem associated with real inner product spaces. But for the complex inner product spaces, if we start with a normal operator, then we can actually create a basis in that vector space made up of eigenvectors. Likewise, if T is a little bit tighter in terms of constraints, if it's not normal but it's self-adjoint in the real inner product space, then we also have these orthonormal bases. And that's pretty strong to have a set of basis vectors that are orthonormal for a given space and having those aligned or associated with eigenvalues that tells you quite a bit about what's going on in that particular inner product space. And the background information will back up and just recall what the Cauchy-Schwarz tells us that now bounds 
the norm of the inner product on the up and the and the back by the negative of their products of norms of the vectors will complete the square and show how that actually relates to something needed to talk about this spectral theorem for the real inner product spaces and before we even get there we'll introduce a couple of lemmas lemma 11 and 12. 11 says that under a specific set of conditions on alpha and beta this operator t squared plus alpha t plus beta i is invertible that requires a certain relationship between alpha and beta these scalars and if T is self-adjoint, then we know that, in fact, that operator has an eigenvalue. And we can't just say that an operator has an eigenvalue, can we? Especially if we're on a real vector space. That operator is not necessarily going to have an eigenvalue, but if it's self-adjoint, then it does. Here's what we talked about last time. If we have an operator on a vec linear vector or a linear operator on a vector space V, and if that operator is normal, then that is an if and only if relationship between these norms. That's proposition 7.6. We showed that last time. We also took the adjoint of this operator and show and demonstrated that indeed it was the same as this expression. So that operator is self-adjoint. And now what we want to start with are some properties of a linear operator being normal. Those two that we'll talk about now are this re these relationships between the eigenvalues of T and the eigenvectors of T and its adjoint. And we, we will show that if we have distinct eigenvalues associated with this linear operator, then we have orthogonal eigenvectors. Now, before we jump into this A part, it's maybe less distracting to go ahead and verify a lemma before which we will use in the proof of the theorem or this corollary. So let's just get that lemma out of the way before we go any further. The lemma that we want to use is stated in the following way. If this linear operator T is normal, then the operator T minus lambda I is also normal. <coughs> Here's a proof. And what we're going to do then is, well, let me just say proof of lemma. We know that certain things are true for an operator to be normal. We have that norm relationship, but we also know that they're, the operator and its adjoint commute. And that's what property we are going to use here. We are going to show that T minus lambda I times its adjoint so we'll dagger t minus lambda i. That's the same as or equivalent to t minus lambda i dagger t minus lambda i. We're basically saying then that t minus lambda i commutes with its adjoint. To do that, let's just compute that expression for the left-hand side and let's compute it for the right-hand side and then show that those two 
expressions are equivalent. If we look at the left hand side of that expression, we have t minus lambda i and t minus lambda i dagger. And what happens if we dagger that last expression? How does that dagger sort of fall into or change t minus lambda i? The dagger slides through. That's just a linear expression, so we can apply the dagger to both pieces of t minus lambda i. We can simply dagger the first piece. And what happens when we take the adjoint of lambda i? If that's a matrix, what happens when we adjoint a matrix? It's the complex conjugate transpose, which if we transpose the identity, that's nothing. But we do have a complex scalar lambda, and so we now can conjugate that. So that that is what we end up with when we dagger that second term on the in that expression. And now let's just start distributing those t's and t daggers. We have t times t dagger. And now it depends on how I want to do this. And let's say now we have minus lambda i t dagger. Now let me do the same for the second term on the right, so that we now have t lambda star i. And we now have plus lambda lambda star i. Or we now have t t dagger. That identity map can be basically absorbed into any of those others. So we now have lambda t dagger. We have minus, and we can slide that scalar in front of or behind wherever we want in that operator. And we have lambda star t. And what happens when we form the product of a complex scalar with its, adjunct, or with its conjugate? We basically get the magnitude squared of that complex number. That's now the expression that we obtain from the left-hand side of that equality. Let's now look at the right-hand side. Which was t minus lambda i dagger t minus lambda i. And we know now how to push that dagger through. We have t dagger minus lambda star i times t minus lambda i. And that now leads to t dagger t minus lambda star i t. And am I doing this exactly the wrong? I don't know if I did it the same way as last time. But now let's do minus lambda. No, I am doing it wrong, aren't I? Or backwards. So I've now taken t dagger t and minus lambda star i t. Let me now take minus t dagger lambda i and a plus lambda star lambda i. Or this now, if, and what did we say? Well, we're going to assume that, I guess I should have maybe told you what I'm going to assume. We're assuming that t is self-adjoint. If t is self-adjoint, then we have t 
T dagger minus lambda star T minus lambda T dagger plus lambda squared I. Or maybe I should say T is, what did we want to say? That it was normal? Oh, if T is normal. So now we're saying that T, we assumed T is normal, which means that T and its adjoint commute, which is what we did in that first term in this expression. And if you compare what's at the very top of this slide with what's at the bottom, you should be able to equate the terms and for that reason, now the right-hand side and the left-hand side are the same, so that we now know that if T is normal, then this operator T minus lambda I is also normal. We showed that the operator and its adjoint commute. Now we can use that as a step in this next corollary. So let's now look at corollary 7, 7, which says that if we're given T, a linear operator on this vector space V, and that T is normal, if a vector in our vector space, little v, is an eigenvector, of our operator T with, let's say, eigenvalue lambda. And we're not saying that that's real or complex. It can be either. Then that same vector, V, is also an eigenvector of the adjoint of that linear operator, of T dagger, so the eigenvectors are the same. The eigenvalues differ by a conjugate. Let's now show that that's in fact the case. Meaning, if you now know that T is normal and you have an eigenvalue eigenvector pair, then you know that you also have an eigenvalue eigenvector pair for the operator's adjoint. Let's now just take those vectors and eigenvalues as given. So let's take V and lambda. as an eigenvector eigenvalue of this normal operator T. And what kind, what's one way of writing that fact? And let's write it all. So now I'm saying write our eigenvalue eigenvector relationship as one equation equaling the zero vector. So if you forget that, you, I hope, know that TV is equal to lambda V. And now we can move the lambda V to the other side. And we have T minus lambda I V equaling 0. So we know that expression is true if lambda and v are an eigenvalue and an eigenvector of t. Now, what did we just show about t minus lambda i? We know that t is normal. That was given. Now, if t was normal, we know that t minus lambda i is also normal. So, T minus lambda I 
is normal, and that's from that lemma that we just showed or worked with. From the above, lemma. What we want to do now is use a different fact or relationship when a operator is normal, and this is now the normed relationship. If I tell you that an operator is normal, then how, what do you know about that operator's adjoint and the norms of those operators and vectors? So Prop 7, 6 is what we want to apply, but now we want to apply it not to T, but to this new normal operator, T minus lambda I. Meaning from Prop 7, 6, if T minus lambda I is normal, we know that T minus lambda I V the norm there is equal to the norm of t minus lambda i dagger times v. But what happens when we dagger that operator on the right hand side inside that norm? We can push that dagger through those two terms, and we now have T dagger minus what happens to the complex scalar when we dagger it. It's now the conjugate I times V. We didn't do anything with V, but we know that T minus lambda I V is zero because it was an eigenvalue eigenvector pair. So it's norm. The norm of the zero vector is zero. We know that this is zero also. And if that's zero, now what do we know about V and lambda star relative to T dagger? V is an eigenvector, isn't it? And lambda star is an eigenvalue. And that's what we were trying to show. V is an eigenvector. Of the adjoint of T. And that particular operator with that eigenvector has an eigenvalue. of lambda star. And that's corollary 7-7. Seven, seven. If you now know that you have a normal operator and you know an eigenvalue eigenvector pair, then you know something about an eigenvalue eigenvector pair for the adjoint of that normal operator. Let's now look at another corollary, which is corollary 8 in the second edition. Again, we're going to start with a linear operator on the vector space V being normal. Given T is a linear operator on V and it's normal. The eigenvectors of T corresponding to distinct eigenvalues are orthogonal. And now no one reminded me that I probably, well, I did forget an announcement.
don't show up for class on Wednesday. Is everybody clear on that? That doesn't mean, I don't know, maybe I'll give you a lecture. I might actually give you a lecture and give you the link to the video and the notes. I haven't yet decided. We may be needing to catch up. So let's stay tuned, but don't come here in 48 hours. Okay? You might want to show up on your terminal or with your laptop somewhere, but not here. Pardon? Yes. So now you can go to a location nearest you, which might be you too. I'm not going to be in Google Hangout. Not to carry on a conversation. Where were we? Corollary 8 in Chapter 7. We now want to show that the eigenvectors associated with distinct eigenvalues are orthogonal. Which is a pretty powerful statement. Now you can say, wow, if I have eigenvectors associated with distinct eigenvalues, then those eigenvectors have an inner product equal to zero. They're orthogonal. Let's now start by making some assignments. Suppose we take alpha and beta to be distinct eigenvalues. These are now scalars. Take alpha and beta as distinct. eigenvalues of our linear operator T. And remember that operator T is normal. And let's assign some eigenvectors to those eigenvalues. Let's say that the eigenvector associated with the eigenvalue alpha is U and the eigenvector V is associated with beta. So I can Let's make that association by just following that description with respectively. What does that mean in terms of an expression? If I said TU, if we were giving cheers and I said TU, you would echo back to me. alpha u. Yes, that's just an eigenvalue eigenvector relationship for the alpha that we said was an eigenvalue associated with the eigenvector u. And if I said tv, you would not give me a program or a show. You would echo back beta v. Is that clear? So that's just the way that we've defined alpha, beta, u, and v to be eigenvalue, eigenvector pairs. Now let's, knowing what we want to show, let's just create an ex a formula. Let's say that we subtract beta from alpha. Those are scalars, so that will just be a complex number in general. And now let's use that to scale an inner product of u with v. We're just taking that expression. Now let's distribute those two scalars through that inner product. Let's take alpha and move it into the first slot. So we could say that this is alpha times inner product uv minus beta inner product with uv. Let's do this now. Well, let's just do that. So this is now alpha uv minus beta uv. But if I now slide those scalars into different slots, if I slide alpha into the first slot, what happens in that inner product expression? It's just alpha u. You guys are getting better at echoing, aren't you? So now we have alpha u inner product with v. And what if I want to push, push beta into the second slot? 
Now we have to do the conjugate homogeneity. This is now minus u beta star v. This first expression, we don't have to get too much involved in our memory. We've already echoed alpha u, and we know that's equal to tu. So we can replace alpha u in the first slot with tu. That's tuv. That's just the definition of, that's that relationship of the eigenvalue eigenvector. But now what I want to do is I now know that TV is equal to beta V, but now I have beta star V. How is that related to this operator T or its adjoint relative to eigenvalues and eigenvectors? And that's where we're going back to that previous result. We know that T had an eigenvalue beta and an eigenvector V. We need to have an eigenvalue beta star and an eigenvector V use the same, but now what do we have? Now we have T dagger V. But, what do we know about that last expression? What's another way of writing this? This is the, if we apply the adjoint definition, this is now just TUV. And that's exactly what the first one was. So that this whole expression, this alpha minus beta, scaling the inner product of U with V, is actually zero. And that's, let's say, by definition, of the adjoint. What we've now shown so far is that alpha minus beta u inner product with v is zero. Now, what did we assume? Did we make any assumptions on this and can we start to maybe extract a little bit more information from this. Now we know that we have a scalar, which is u comma v. That's just a scalar times another scalar equaling zero. If we have two scalars equaling zero, what do we know has to be true? One of those scalars needs to be zero. But what did we assume about this alpha and beta relationship? We assumed, to begin with, that those were different, didn't we? They're distinct, and that immediately says that this scalar can't be zero. Alpha can't equal beta. So one of the scalars is non-zero in this expression that equals zero. The other scalar has to be zero, and the other scalar was this inner product of u with v. And what does this tell us? Or what is this? If we know the inner product of two vectors equals zero, what do we know about those two vectors? That's the definition of those vectors being orthogonal. And that's what we set out to show or to prove. Which says then that if we have distinct eigenvalues of a normal operator, then we know, so if that operator is normal, it's not a generic operator, it's a normal operator, which says that it commutes with its adjoint. If that's the case, then we know that if we have distinct eigenvalues, the eigenvectors of those distinct eigenvalues are orthogonal. That now allows us to get to 
one of the big results that we've been waiting to get to. I know you've just been waiting all semester to get here, and this is now the spectral theorem. Spectral really just means eigenvalues. And let's now write down this whole buildup. We now come this really this almost sounds like it should be rolling in front of our eyes on a movie. We now come to the end of our quest. <laughs> And I didn't forget the I-O-N. That, that is quest, not question. We now come to the end of our quest to find, I don't know if you remember, but remember we were talking about nice things, something being nice, and we wanted a nice basis or for the plural, we have bases. So now we've found some nice bases that we can play with. And that now, is, they are nice because this is going to yield diagonal matrices. Remember the appeal. of diagonal matrix representations. That's easy to manipulate or think about if we're just sort of doing things with scalars now. We've basically broken down this complex, let's say, n-dimensional operator into one-dimensional operations by diagonalizing or ending up with this diagonal matrix representation. Remember also that an operator only has a diagonal representation if there exists a basis consisting of eigenvectors of the operator. And we actually are going to make this even a little bit cleaner. Let's go ahead and make that basis orthonormal, which means now if we're normalizing things, we now have this concept of length, which we were able to introduce from Chapter 6 by having these inner products. So instead of just being on a vector space, now we're on an inner product space with these operators. We'll add... a further constraint that we'd like an orthonormal basis which means we must be in an inner product space. Since to normalize things, we need this distance or length of these vectors. The spectral theorem actually tells us
which operators have eigenvectors let's say that can produce such an orthonormal basis and therefore which operators have a nice diagonal representation And as I hinted at at the beginning, this answer or how this how we can start talking about these different operators really depends on whether we're dealing with a complex inner product space or a real inner product space. The answer depends on whether we are dealing. with a real or complex inner product space. And as we've learned, it's usually easier to mess with complex vector spaces or complex inner product spaces versus real. So let's start with the easier case, which is the complex inner product space. This is theorem 7.9, which is the complex spectral theorem. Now we have this vector space V is not just a vector space, but it's a complex inner product space. V is a complex inner product space. And now we have an operator on that, a linear operator on that complex inner product space. The theorem says that V, this vector complex inner product space V, has an orthonormal basis consisting of eigenvectors of the linear operator T if and only if T is normal. So if T is normal and we have a vector space that's a complex inner product space, then we can actually find an orthonormal basis and that orthonormal basis will actually be the eigenvectors of that linear operator. Yes, so now we're saying that to be a basis, remember what it meant to be a basis, it had to be spanning the entire space. So now what we need to do to find this orthonormal basis is really compute the eigenvectors of this linear map and normalize those if they aren't already normalized.
once we have all the eigenvectors, then if our operator t is normal, then those vectors will be the full list that we need to form a basis. And we'll have enough eigenvectors if t is normal. So that's what we want to show. And this is one of those if and only if theorems. So we can say, here's statement A. Let's show that that implies B, and B implies A. Let's now go in both directions, or show both. So we need to prove both directions. In the first direction, let's assume that we have an orthonormal basis of eigenvectors of t. That's statement A. That's on the left side of that if and only if. Let's now say that let's assume V has an orthonormal basis of eigenvectors of t. And the fact that we're saying orthonormal, that's really saying that we are on an inner product space. Now, if we have an orthonormal basis of eigenvectors of t, what does that tell us about the matrix representation of that linear operator t? If our eigenvectors are orthonormal, and we know that what is an eigenvector? That's an invariant subspace. If I now started asking you to echo back certain properties, if I said TV1, you would say lambda1 V1. If I said TV2, you would say lambda sub 2 V sub 2. We now have this entire set of eigenvectors, and they are orthonormal. Now we know that V1 and V2 are orthogonal. And so now we know that we only have these invariant subspaces in one dimension for all of these different pieces, which says that T then has a diagonal matrix representation. Now, if we know that the matrix representation of T, let's say script M of T, is diagonal, what do we know about the matrix representation of T dagger? Or how is the matrix representation of T dagger related to the matrix representation of T? They're complex conjugate transposes, aren't they, of each other. So this matrix representation of T dagger is the conjugate transpose of M of T. And what's that mean then about T dagger? That also has this diagonal representation with respect to this basis. T 
T dagger also has a diagonal representation or a diagonal form with respect to this basis. So that now we have a matrix representation of T and a matrix representation of T dagger, we can form their product. We have the product of two diagonal matrices. Let's consider what that gives us. Let's consider the product of two diagonal matrices. Meaning if I have A1, A2, A sub n, and I have 0 on the off diagonals, and I have B1, B2, B sub n, and 0 on the off diagonals, what does that equal? That's just a diagonal, isn't it, with the products of those respective subscripted variables. A1 is just going to scale the first row, and that just has B1. A2 scales the second row. Or you could say B1 scales the first column, B2 scales the second column. However you want to think of it, you now have... you've maintained or can kept a diagonal matrix representation. But what happens if we flipped those, the order of those matrices? If we now took the B and pre-multiplied that by, or into the A, you get exactly the same result because those scalars commute at the end. So we get the same result if we were to look at B1, B2, B sub n times A1, A2, A sub n, we now have B1, A1, B2, A2, B sub n, A sub n, which really says that any two diagonal matrices commute. And that's really what we were wanting because we needed to show that T was normal or that T and T dagger commuted. And now we've shown that their matrix representations commute. Therefore, any two diagonal matrices commute which now says that T dagger is equal to T dagger T, and that's the definition of T being normal. And that's what we were trying to show in starting with statement A. Statement A was, say, assume that we have a basis made up of orthonormal eigenvectors of this operator T. If we go in the other direction, now we're starting with T being normal. And what we want to show is that we end up with a diagonal matrix representation of this linear operator. 
But if we just have a generic operator T on a complex inner product space, what do we know about it in terms of a way to represent it? Is there a special basis or can we find somewhat of a nice basis for that generic operator T? Do we know anything about the structure of any generic operator on a complex vector space? And this now is going all the way back to chapter 5. T, we can say, is upper triangular. T has an upper triangular representation. And that's actually true for any operator on a complex vector space. So it must be true if T is normal. So this is theorem 13 in chapter 5. If that's the case, then we can write down the matrix representation of that T for some basis. Let's say the basis is E1, E2, E sub N. So that now we have an upper triangular representation. We have an A11, an A12, an A13, all the way to an A1N. We have an A22 an A23, A2N, and we can just keep going. We have zero below the diagonal, and we have then potentially terms above the diagonal for this upper triangular representation. And this is with E1, E2, E sub N being some orthonormal basis. That's just a result of theorem 13 in chapter 5, that we can now have an upper triangular representation with an orthonormal basis. Now, from this, what can we start to maybe see? Now if we look at this matrix representation of T operating on E1, the first orthonormal basis vector. E, we now have A1, 1, A1, 2, up to A1, N. A2, 2, up to A2, N, 0 below an A sub N, N. But now, E1 is a basis, orthonormal basis, and if we pick that basis vector E1 to be 1, 0, 0, then we end up with what for our result? A11 or in the 1, 1 entry, which is really just another way of scaling that E1 vector with A11. So that now E1 is invariant with respect to T. 
Now, if we looked at the norm of TE1, let's say the square of that norm, what do we know that's equal to? Now we're looking at the norm squared of this vector that really just has one non-zero entry. And it's in terms of an orthonormal basis. And what result did that tell us about these entries or coordinates of that vector? Could we relate those scalars to the norm squared of that vector? So we take the magnitude of A11, or its modulus, and square it. And we would add that to zeros modulus squared plus zeros modulus. So let's just forget all of those zeros. It's just the modulus of A11 squared. So we know that that's true. Now, we want to... basically show that the matrix representation of T is going to be diagonal. So we want to somehow maybe make this representation even tighter than being upper triangular. What we've shown is for the linear map T that the norm of TE1 squared is equal to this, the modulus or the magnitude of just one number, scalar squared. What can we say about the matrix representation of T dagger? If we already know that the matrix representation of T is upper triangular, we now know what happens to the matrix representation of T dagger. It's the conjugate transpose of this, isn't it? Of that square matrix. Similarly, we can consider the matrix representation of T dagger as the conjugate transpose of the matrix representation of T and conclude if we now looked at T dagger E1, and E1 is just pulling off the first column of whatever operator is in front of it, and we know the first column of T dagger is A11 star, A12 star, but we know how the stars or the conjugate of scalars are related to the, or we know the relationship of the magnitudes of those conjugates relative to the scalar itself so that now this is just each of those in the original top row of T their magnitudes squared. by that one theorem that we had from earlier as far as what's this vector, the norm of that vector squared is equal to these coordinates or of these scalars magnitude squared. But what was the only thing that we started in this second half of the proof, this is now where we were assuming that T was normal. And if T is normal, now we have this relationship between norms. With T being normal, the proposition that we stated at the beginning of today's lecture said that we could say that the norm squared of TV is 
equal to t dagger v's norm squared. And that was true for any v. We can specialize that to where v is just e1. If we now take v equal to e1, we can see that this now implies, if now we're saying that we have t e1 squared equaling t dagger e1 squared. And t e1 squared was equal to what? That was just a 11s magnitude squared. And t dagger e1 squared was the sum of all of these magnitudes squared. What, if the left side is equal to the right side, what's that implying about some of those terms on the right side? They have to be zero, don't they? They're non-negative. So now we can conclude that the magnitude of A12, which if its magnitude is equal to zero, then it itself has to equal zero. So that's now equal to A13, et cetera, all the way down to A1n, which is equal to zero. And if all of those entries to the right of the leading entry in the first row of our matrix representation of T or zeros, we've now cleaned up or made a little bit nicer the matrix representation of T. The matrix representation of T must really look like A11 and then everything to the right is zero. We haven't yet said anything about A22, A23, A2n, etc. But we knew we started with an upper triangular. But we can just continue this whole process with the submatrices that result. So if we repeat that for E2, E3, all the way down to E sub n, what happens to the matrix representation of T? It's now diagonal. So now the matrix representation of T is now diagonal. And the eigenvectors of T now do form an orthonormal basis. So that's now the complex spectral theorem, which says the following. 
if V is a complex inner product space and we have a operator on that complex inner product, a linear operator, then V has an orthonormal basis consisting of eigenvectors of that linear operator if and only if T is normal. If T is normal on a complex inner product space, then we can have a really nice set of basis vectors. They're orthogonal, they've been normalized, and they're actually eigenvectors. That, those are pretty powerful basis vectors. Now we have a nice way of decomposing this vector space V. Now we have a direct sum decomposition of V in terms of an orthonormal basis, and in fact that orthonormal basis is associated with eigenvectors of this linear operator T. That is normal. So if you can show that T and its adjoint commute, now you know something about the basis vectors that you can create on that complex inner product space. Or if you can show or if you see that TV's norm is equal to T dagger V's norm for all V, again you can now say, oh, now I have this set of basis vectors that are orthonormal and they are actually eigenvectors of this operator T. Questions on that? Yes. So, so far, all we've looked at is one P, or a, we've broken it, the spectral theorem we're separating into two pieces. One is concerned with complex inner product spaces, and the other one's going to be for real inner product spaces. It's, what do I want to say? It's more general, the spectral theorem, when we're dealing with complex inner product spaces. We're going to have to assume more restrictive conditions on our linear operator when we get into real inner product spaces. And in addition to that, we're not just going to be able to jump in immediately to the real inner product or the real spectral theorem. Now we have to go and do some background work or lay the foundation for moving into and what are we going to see? Well now, instead of T being normal, T needs to be self-adjoint. If T is self-adjoint on a real inner product space, then we can have this nice orthonormal basis. And that's going to require that we look at basically four more things before we jump into the real spectral theorem description. So, yes, we're looking, that was only for complex inner product spaces that T being normal allows us to conclude or have or an orthonormal basis. Other questions? So we will pick up, actually I guess, hmm, I will decide sometime, I might give you this real stuff, the real stuff before we see each other again in a week, but I won't see you on Wednesday in this class, okay?